Boop. There you go. What was that? Recording. I hate that. The way we did go low. You guys know I started recording this like right before you started doing that. So like someone's gonna start the YouTube video and it's got you singing and dancing. Too bad they can't see him dancing. It was fantastic. Let me tell you. So we're beginning chapter 11, section 1. Oh. Scramble for Africa. I'm trying to explain something to call scramble. Like scramble is not clutch. That's something entirely different. Clutch? What is it for slang words? What kind of song is so clutch? That's not a pants. That's not pants. It's crazy. That is just making up, you know, making a word mean something entirely different. Yeah. Clutch is like what you do when you don't. No, and like you bring the drive somewhere. Clutch is when you drive, right? Well, the clutch is part of your car. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you to switch gear. But uh, the term clutch can can mean refer to like you know if you like do like a really impressive shot like right when you have to or things like that you know. Clutch. It's like you know it's like you did exactly what you had to do exactly when you had to do it. Can it also be a first? Yeah. That's first. A clutch, yeah, that's true. Which comes with the terminology to grab something to clutch it. Yeah. You know. Anyways, no, but you know, that was our yeah. English lesson for the day. All right, enough. So let's talk Africa for a second. It's a big place. It's not a country. Anyone who thinks it is wrong. Um, yeah, I, I just think it's kind of funny because, you know, as far as gross generalizations are concerned, you know, we're, we're pretty bad about it. It's not really like our fault per se because that's how we generalize information. I mean, our whole experience of our life is basically generalizations. You know, we get to know people and expect people to behave in a certain way because we met other people similar to them. It's a survival instinct, but when it applies to uh, knowing the world, it gets a little silly. Um, like for instance, people thinking that Chinese food is Chinese food. <laughs> you know, it's actually kind of funny too because it works both ways. Like if you go online and um, look up questions like, you know, American food, you know, what, what American foods do Americans or do non-Americans think about? And it's stuff like you probably wouldn't expect. Like, you know, number one drink that most non-Americans uh, think of when they think of America. Any guesses? Coke, alcohol, coffee, no. root beer. What? That's weird. Root beer. It's not, it's not drunk anywhere else. Not really. It's a kind of an American thing. In fact, most people around the world think it's disgusting. And the reason is, is that it actually makes some sense. A lot of cough syrups around like Europe and, and even in parts of Asia are flavored like root beer. So like to them, that's cough syrup taste. Sort of like, you know, if you've ever had like the fake cherry taste, you know, it's like, you know, it's the same thing here, you know. But uh, just stuff like that, it's a generalization and like, you know, there's a bad like think about like you know American foods that are around the world that you know they think that's the quintessential American diet is things like Easy Mac and Cheese, Cheese Whiz in a can, uh, things like that, just stuff that's like hugely fatty and gross. And like, is it any wonder that they think we're just horribly obese people? You know, um, that's not true in, in reality. So it kind of goes both ways. And as far as geography is concerned, you know, I I tend to think we we think that Africa's Lion King. You know, it's all yeah. Serengeti playing and God's oh, it's a The guy's true. holding up cats. It's not true. <laughs> Almost no cats ever get picked up. It's very sad. No. <laughs> um, but uh, no, that's only one small part of Africa. Climate-wise, it's pretty diverse. I mean, if you look at it on the map here, we're stretching basically from 40 degrees north to 40 degrees south of longitude. I mean, it's a huge place. It's the biggest country, or continent, I mean to say, in the world. Um, and it's, it's got a lot of different diverse places, which means it's got a lot of diverse people. So, you know, we can make generalizations, uh, such as the people that speak Bantu languages in the north uh, speaking Arab because they're descended from the Arab conquest and all these types of things. But generally speaking, that's a gross estimation. And that's more than most people do. So you might be asking yourself, well, where does this come from? You know, where does all these attitudes come from about Africa and what it's experienced? Because, I mean, I tend to think it's slightly negative. Like most Americans tend to think that everyone in Africa is dirt poor living in a shack. And that's not true at all. Um, 
and, and the fact is, is a lot of it, a lot of our literature from Africa, a lot of our experience comes from either the Lion King or holdovers from the 19th, uh, or rather 20th century, um, early 20th century, late 19th century, uh, such as movies like Zulu Dawn. And um, that's because Europeans, for much of the 19th century, were basically, um, you know, completely unaware of what was going on in Africa. As far as the interior is concerned, uh, there were colonies in Africa, but it was pretty much exclusively tied to the coast. They never ventured in because they didn't have anything that they really wanted. You know, pretty much uh, the Europeans' early interest in Africa was first as trade outposts and then slaves. Well, slavery has been abolished, and we don't really need a trade outpost like that anymore. What we need is raw materials, natural resources. So people start pushing into the interior. And before we get to that, most people pretty much expect Africa to be like this. <laughs> Lots of wild animals, wild savages out to get you. It's a dangerous, crazy place. You know, it's basically the American West, but with lions. In fact, you can see a lot of parallels attitude about the Australian outback the African Serengeti, and then the American West. Um, mostly in attitude, not actually in geography. They're very different places. But uh, suffice it to say, um, it is definitely something that uh, weighed on the European consciousness. And um, we're going to get into some of the hows and whys behind that. So to start off, let's talk about this term, imperialism. Uh, does anyone know what is imperialism? If I say imperialism, like what does that word mean? Like if we're talking about countries expanding, yeah, it's true. What else? Nothing? I mean, yeah, it's part of imperialism. You guys, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing an absolute blank here. You just have no idea. Just like, I don't really want to try to care. I don't care to guess. I don't know. Interesting. Okay. Imperialism. Um, does that sound like a word, you know? Yeah. It sounds familiar. Empire? Yeah. What's an empire? Um, like they would rule. Like a higher ruling over people? Like a higher ruling over people? Oh, it's that. Kind of like king and queen things, but only one person rules. Kind of. I mean, king and queen has that too. Generally speaking, empire is a more militant term, uh, for one thing, uh, because we're talking about an that's been conquered. That's an empire. A kingdom. I mean, yes, to some extent it's been conquered, but generally speaking, we're talking about like one area, whereas an empire is massive over many kingdoms. So imperialism, basically, at its heart, is about setting up empires. What it really means is where one country dominates another country in every possible way, politically, culturally, economically, in every possible way. So that the culture of this conquered people is suppressed in favor of the uh, conquering nations. So to put into perspective, Latin America was added as a Spanish empire. Think about what's culturally dominant there today. Roman Catholicism, the religion of the Spanish empire. What language is spoken there? The language of the Spanish empire. What system of law did they use? Law systems based off of the Spanish Empire. Basically, everything that was Latin American, which to say Native American, was suppressed and replaced with the Spanish. So the same thing is going to happen throughout Africa. As these conquering nations and empires come in, they disallow the indigenous people to continue with their cultural traditions and instead suppress them and put in place the English culture or the Spanish culture or the French culture or whatever the conquering nation happens to be in that particular area of Africa, which is why Africa today has a huge diversity of languages, including European ones. 
There are areas in Africa where people speak English mostly. Areas where French, areas where Arabic, things like that because of the nations that came in and conquered them. That is a legacy of imperialism. It's left over from imperialism. It's there because imperialism occurred. Does that make sense? So when I say that something has a legacy of imperialism, what I'm talking about is what has changed because these other nations came. So for instance, language is certainly one of them, but there are many other legacies. For instance, Africa's traditional societies were tribal by nature. Now, when we think of tribes, we've probably got all these things in our minds going around from Native American tribes to uh, these tattoos that people like to get nowadays. And, and really, it's an oversimplification of a fairly complex relationship. One's tribe is one's family, one's culture, and one's ethnicity all wrapped up into one sense of identity. Uh, people of different pop tribes would literally see themselves as being part of a different race. And consider, much of life is competition, especially uh, whenever you're living in a hunting-gathering society, which a lot of tribes did. Even more sedentary tribes still have a lot of competition for resources, namely water. So the fact is, you have a lot of competition of tribes trying to make their tribe the most successful to live, to be, pe be peaceful, to have these great things, but they have to do so at the expense of others. So this meant that one's tribe was in in intrinsically more trustworthy than, say, someone's nation. And that's going to be a big deal. Because when the Europeans finally become interested in the interior for the interest of exploiting natural resources, they are going to move into these places and they are going to find all these tribes and use tribal animosities against each other. And the way they're going to do that initially is in the Conference of Berlin in 1884. Now, Here's what happens at the Berlin Conference. You have a lot of different European nations who want to create these empires so that they can fuel the industrial machines that have been created during the Industrial Revolution. And so they need resources like rubber and petroleum and things that they need to import from these places. And they are in competition with each other to get to those places first. Well, a war nearly breaks out between all the nations of Europe over the control of Africa. So in order to keep that from happening, a group of European diplomats hash out a new map of Africa where we can divide it amongst the various European nations so that we don't fight each other. In turn, in order to take advantage of these tribal animosities, tribes were often put into areas of conquest with their enemies and not with their allies. The reason being, if England is attacking an area with two enemies, they're not going to work together against the British. If they did that, it would have made it much harder for Britain to actually go through the plans of adding that to their empire. So it was this old tactic of divide and conquer that to this day is a major problem in Africa because you have countries like Sudan where you've got groups of tribes that have been fighting for centuries do not get along well, and now you're going to try to make them cooperate in the form of a democratic government? How does that work? And the answer is not very well. So a lot of the political problems that face Africa today stem from the Berlin Conference and European imperialism. That is a second cultural uh, and, and um, ex political legacy of imperialism. With me on that? Cool beans. So that's the Berlin Conference in a nutshell. Another thing we have to understand is how exactly a European could wrap their mind around this. Because didn't we just abolish slavery? How can we then basically enslave people again who just said, no, it's free, it's a tool? How do we do this again only on entire nations? Largely because of the attitude of social Darwinism. Do you guys remember what social Darwinism is?
it's an inherently racist ideology. It comes from Darwinism's theory of evolution. What does the theory of evolution state about a um, survival of the fittest? What does that mean? Like the, like the more you're like prepared for, for like the more things you have, like good going for you, like the better off you're gonna be, and like you're gonna survive, and like the other ones that are different are gonna die off. And right. The, the species that has the better advantages will be able to survive, while ones that have lesser advantages or no advantages will die. Okay, that makes sense. That's why we would have creatures that have very specific adaptations to their environment survive, others that don't, don't. But this begs a question. Does this apply to human beings? Does this apply to societies? If you believe in that ideology, then it makes sense from a certain perspective that white people must be superior to non-white people because their empires have flourished while others have stagnated or fallen apart. You see what I'm saying? It's an inherently racist ideology. So this was also used as a justification for the utter uh, conquest of various peoples around the world. Because we're really doing it for their own good. They're so backwards and cruel to each other, we'll just come in and just make everything better for them. We'll just make them white. And that's the inherent nature of it. So really what it comes down to is it's a racist ideology which is used to legitimize the plundering of countries, which is what imperialism was. We're taking natural resources from one country to feed them to another. That's imperialism. Okay? So here's the interesting question. Has anything really changed? I mean, it's over a hundred years later, and do we still have these relationships? To some extent, yes, although it's changed a little bit. Because you see, a lot of countries have industrialized, yet they are still not as wealthy as countries that are post-industrialization. Most of our jobs in the United States are not in industry and manufacturing. Only about 20% are. 70% are in service industries. So that's when we say we're post-industrial because we're not manufacturing anymore. Yet we still make a tremendous amount of money. We have a huge economy. Why? Again, it's the next progression, so to speak. We're not making stuff. We're not even selling stuff. We're providing things that other people cannot do. That's a service. So what we see happening is a new age of imperialism, not so much based on the extraction of raw materials, but rather the extraction of manufactured goods. It's the same relationship, just a little different. You with me on that a little bit? So again, it's this kind of legacy we're talking about. The Boer War is going to be one of these first instances where Europeans fight Europeans. The Boers, which actually the Dutch word being farmer, were a group of Dutch that had settled in South Africa and basically were growing wine plants, essentially. Southern Africa, wine-wise, is actually really close to California. It's kind of almost like Mediterranean climate. It was really good for growing stuff like that. Anyhow, so they're shipping this stuff out, and the English come in and take over. And at first, they kind of work together, but then it turns as things tend to do uh, to violence, and the Boers are pushed out of Southern Africa by the English, and they're pushed north. Well, as they try to settle new lands up north, they end up encroaching on lands controlled by a different tribe, which are the Zulu. And the Zulu utterly smash the Boers. But uh, that's kind of another story. You see, the Zulu, um, well, actually, let me step away from the Zulu for a second, go back to the tribe side for a second. So another thing we have to understand about a tribe is they also function as a government. So what happens when you're in the military of a tribe, you're fighting with literally your family members. You go to war with your family. So there's a lot of an emotional attachment that fellow soldiers, and not to say that they're on nowadays either, but this is significant as well because being in a hunter-gatherer society or being in a farming society, being with a tribe, if we lose too many people in a battle, 
the tribe will die of starvation. But we need people to work farms. We need these people to come back alive. So what we found, if you analyze wars that occur in tribal areas, such as between Native Americans or between uh, these African tribes, we see a common theme. And that is, whenever we're talking numbers of casualties, people dying in the battlefield, most battles will end with about 5% casualties, very low. Um, for instance, in the War of 1812, professional US soldiers would fight until they had 15% casualties, and at 15%, their morale would be so broken they would turn and they would rout. Um, militia, maybe around 5%, 10%, somewhere in between there, better than the tribe, the natives that they were fighting. So why is this? Well, the social Darwinists would say, well, that's because natives are just naturally more cowardly. You know, white men are much braver. But if you analyze it, it's not because of that. It's because of the way the armies are structured. In the military, if a commanding officer says, go march in this machine gun nest, you do it. Because that's the order you're given. You must obey orders. In the tribal society, they wouldn't ask you to do that anyways because it's too much of a risk. Uh, it's not about killing the opponent. It's about securing our rights. And a lot of that's accomplished through intimidation and psychological warfare. Back to Shaka Zulu. He is the chief, if you will, really theaters of that terminology, of the Zulu nation, a large group, a large empire that he had put together. And the way he did this was by changing military tactics. You see, Shaka was actually a very low-born person. Uh, he was technically the son of a chief, but it was through like an unfavored wife. I think he was like third or something like that. He really wasn't expected to do much. Yet through his own cunning and politicking, he was able to rise up as leader of the entire nation. So he's a really smart guy. He also changed military tactics by toughening up his troops in a special exercise in martial arts routine that is still used by the special forces of the world today. I'm talking Marines are sissies, comparatively. Dudes are hard as nails. One of the things they used to do uh, is in Africa, Southern Africa, you have this type of plant that is like brambles on, on steroids. You guys know brambles? It's like vines with little spikes on it. Okay, so spikes are like that long. He would have his troops march over them barefoot all day long so that they would basically learn to ignore pain. You know, these guys were tough as nails. And they were hugely intimidating, too. They would form lines and, you know, beat squares on shields, chanting and do this kind of thing. They, they, were, they were trying to get in your head and freak you out and scare you because scared people don't fight well. So it was all about psychology. And they had this really kind of neat tactic uh, that roughly translates to the uh, ox formation. And basically what you would do is you'd form three companies, two on the outside and one in the middle. The middle company would be all your veteran soldiers. I'll get to why here in a second. The outer companies were filled with your young, kind of inexperienced, but really quick and able-bodied guys. And what would happen is these guys would remain hidden. And as these guys come forward, and this is your enemy, they see these folks, and they're doing that war chant. They're getting all of their attention while your other troops swing out to the side and around. And basically, they're trying to go these folks into a mistake. When they join in battle, it doesn't just come from the front, but from all the way around, and they just squeeze you, crack you like a nut. It worked against the British using guns while the Zulu were using spears. The Zulu defeated a modern military power using spears and shields. That's pretty freaking intense, you know? Now, that being said, eventually the Zulu lose because they aren't able to hold it together. But for quite a while, they are able to do amazing things. And it's all due to Shaka's kind of restructuring of the military. Uh, but this is a picture showing the Berlin Conference and the eventual map of Africa. Another thing we're going to see happen is some truly horrific abuses of human rights. You know, we like to focus on the Holocaust as being this major terrible happening as if like that was the only one in the world. The fact was, 
like there were things happening in colonial Africa far worse than transatlantic slave trade, even the Holocaust going on. For instance, uh, when King Leopold II of Belgium took the Congo area, he discovered that this was an area rich in rubber, something that was very valuable for the production of industrial goods. And so he ended up basically enslaving the entire region and forcing compliance, forcing them to work to death. And if you did not comply, uh, the choice punishment was whacking off the arms or the legs. Um, for instance, you guys would recall the Blood Diamond video I showed you last year. Um, where do you think they got that idea from? We're talking hundreds of thousands losing their lives, you know. And you know, it's just yeah, you got to look at somebody like that and ask, like, how is this possible? Ideology. If you don't see them as human, you can treat them however you want. You know, you might come back saying something along the lines of, but we treat animals better than that, don't we? No. I think it depends. But I would I would question sometimes. Well, look at what we do with animals a lot of times. It might make you think. And there's some things that are pretty terrifying, you know. And we do try to do better things like that. But the fact that we're treating a human being like an animal alone is pretty horrific. You know what I mean? I mean that's that's what's going on here, and it's all because of this ideology of social Darwinism. So. We have this kind of beginning of the issues we see in Africa today occurring in the uh, 1800s. In fact, one of the more famous incidents that occurs that kind of draws attention to the African interior and draws European interest are these explorers. Um, you have to understand the technology of the um, telegraph allows for instant communication, allows us to understand things that are going on around the world, such as explorations that are occurring and new discoveries. One example of this um, was actually uh, sort of a publicity event where um, Henry Stanley, who was an American newspaper man, was sent in search of a missionary named David Livingston who had disappeared. Uh, in the African interior, and uh, basically he found him in this one secluded area, and whenever he met him, the first words he said to him, first words this guy had heard in English for years, uh, were immortalized, and that's simply uh, Dr. Livingston, I presume. So it's one of these things that, you know, it's a big quote in history, but really comes down to is this, is this guy been living and not hearing his own language for years. Imagine what that would be like, you know? That's one of the things that, you know, I, I always encourage folks to learn another language. Um, and of course, Spanish is, is a chosen language here. And you know, some people get a little bit upset about that. And they're like, oh my God, well, we got to learn Spanish. People come here should learn English. And it's true. If you're moving to a country, you should learn a language. But think about moving to a country and you're never going to hear your, 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 your uh, native language ever again or very infrequently. You know, I, I used to work at Walgreens, uh, which, you know, um, I'm going to go with this. And, uh, you know, especially through college and things like that, I used to be fluent in Spanish. And I could speak very, very well. I, I had people tell me that all the time. And so, like, just kind of when I had folks who were, um, you know, did not speak English, you know, uh, they spoke uh, Spanish, would come in, and I'll never forget just how grateful people were. Just, oh my God, someone understands me. Like, you could see them physically, oh, thank God, and things like that. And just like, like they come in, they have no idea where stuff is. Imagine trying to figure out where stuff is still and not be able to ask. You know what I mean? It's pretty rough. And you know, I'll never forget this one, like, all, all she needed was a Tylenol. You know, and she's just like, she's almost in tears because she can't figure it out. I just go up to her and say, you know, what, are you, what are you looking for? You know, in Spanish. And she's just, it was, it was, you know, I got hugged. It was awesome. You know? But it was just one of those things that, you know, you, you kind of have to look into someone else's viewpoint. You know? you know? Say what you will about Tom Hanks. He's a phenomenal actor. And the thing that sold that to me, because a lot of people say, like, you know, what's that? 
I don't know, right? But some people like it, and you just, just like they make fun of them. But here's the thing is, right, people often say Castaway, great action movie, and it was. But the thing that sold me on his acting ability was the terminal. Because the very beginning of the movie, he doesn't speak English. And, you know, he's sitting there, he's this guy, and he's talking like, this is where I'm from. And it's going undergoing a military coup. And he's like, oh, yeah, this is where I'm from. So he's in the sees the tanks coming and crushing things, and he just starts flipping out. Because imagine what that would be like, you know? It's the same sort of thing. Language is part of us. It's who we are. It's where we're from. It's everything, you know? And it's just kind of, I think, interesting that this word, uh, or this phrase, rather, um, Dr. Livingston, I presume, it's it, it's just a greeting. That's all it is. It's like, hey, hey, bye, hey, buddy, you know? It'd be like, you know, immortalizing yourself for all eternity in the human condition, saying, so. You know? And... It means so much more than that. It's just interesting to me. I don't know. Wait, why was he, like, gone? He was a missionary. He was trying to spread Christianity. Oh. In fact, really, these are the only people that are going in the interior in the early part of the 19th century because they're wanting to either spread Christianity or they're just going to go find stuff, you know. But what starts changing is the building of railroads. We're building railroads and settling the interior. And that's actually... Take the weapons, take the whatever. It's the... Railroad, that is the most important weapon that the Europeans have because it allows them to move people and material faster than anything else can. That's Shaka. It's a kind of westernized portrayal, but it's close ish. But it gives an idea of kind of what he looks like, maybe. But this right here is another significant technology that changes the way that we're going to wage war forever. Guys, think about it for just a second. The most devastating weapon ever created by human hands. Mostly you're probably thinking of the nuclear bomb. Yet consider this. How many people actually died by nuclear bomb? Not that many. Only about uh, 400,000, 400,000. Which, my thought, wasn't that a lot? Consider this. In World War I, some 10 million people lost their lives. And the number one killer on the battlefield... The machine gun. The Maxim gun is the very first full, real, true machine gun. Now, to understand machine guns, uh, do you guys know how a firearm works on the inside? Okay. It's not something that's commonly known, I find. But basically, here's how it goes in a nutshell. So, from the early years of muzzle loaders, we've progressed to using what we consider a bullet. In truth, a bullet is actually a cartridge. That's the terminology. And basically, here's the distinction. If you think of like what a bullet looks like, if you ever shot a gun, you're probably thinking of something that looks more or less like this. you got a cylinder, you got a little hidden thing like that, and you got a little round part. That's the bullet, yeah? This front part is the bullet. What happens is that the very back, you've got a blasting cap. When you pull the trigger on a gun, a firing pin strikes that, causing it to ignite. Uh, it's actually real similar. If you guys ever had a cap done as a kid that's got the orange plastic caps, it's kind of like that, just much more powerful. So that ignites. There's gunpowder in here that, when it ignites, pushes the bullet through the expansion of gas. With me so far? So that's a bullet. How a gun works depends on the mechanism that it reloads itself. Because the most basic form is, it doesn't reload itself. You pop open the breech, pull the spent case out, put in a new one, snap the breech shut, fire again. It's faster than, say, a muzzle loader, but not much faster. Then you have more rapid fire selections. For instance, Remington came up with an idea where you would have a tube that was called a magazine, and in it you would stuff bullets and it would use a spring to push a bullet into the chamber when a lever was pushed forward, opening up the chamber and releasing the spent cartridge and putting a new one in its place. So you could fire, cock, fire, cock, fire, cock, feel like that. We also are probably familiar with revolvers, where it's got a cylinder with bullets in it, and when you pull the trigger, it fires it, and you pull back the hammer, it spins the cylinder, putting a new bullet in line. The machine gun works off the premise of uh, Newton's law of equal but opposite reactions. Specifically, whenever the gas is expanding, it's actually pushing in both directions, isn't it? 
So what it is, instead of having a solid chunk of metal that's in the breach, which is where the bullet is, uh, it actually is floating on springs. So the gas pushing on it actually forces it opening up the chamber and kicking out the old bullet through a spring. And that has another spring underneath in the magazine, pushing the next bullet into line. And then as the gas dissipates, it slides the uh, breech back shut, pre-cocking the gun so you can pull the trigger again. That's how a semi-automatic works. With a machine gun, it's the same thing, only you hold down the trigger, and the fun funneling of gases basically allows you to fire, 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 just over and over and over again. Now, consider this, rate of fire. That's how many shots a soldier can get off in a minute, all right? So, in the revolution, using muskets, a soldier could get three shots in a minute. With the repeating rifle, you could get something like 20 to 50 if you're really, really, really fast. With the Maxim gun, you could get 600 shots a minute. This makes one man an army. Now, generally speaking, one guy couldn't carry this because the gun weighs 60 pounds. The little tripod I'd sit on weigh another 40 to 50 pounds, and then you've got ammunition on top of that. So you'd have three man teams, one with the gun, one with the tripod, one with ammunition. But still, three guys, if they set up with enough ammo, can basically kill an entire army by themselves. So this weapon used successfully throughout Africa is what allows the Europeans to press their advantage. That and some other weapons, such as the Henry Martini rifle and things like that. However, understand that machine guns are inherently defensive weapons. You're not going to charge in using these type of weapons. They're too big. Eventually, we make smaller, personal, or what are called submachine guns, but they, they basically are, are, are the same apparatus, just smaller. Now, problems. The Maxim gun did have some disadvantages, specifically jamming. Uh, if you have that many rounds going through, something can go wrong. And what happens when it goes wrong? Well, it just stops firing, because the alternative is for it to explode, and that's bad. <laughs> And one of the main problems with it doing so was the barrel overheating. You guys know how friction works, yeah? Friction generates heat. Imagine the amount of heat generated by explosions and the friction of 700 bullets a minute riding through a metal tube. Eventually, the barrel just warps and won't fire anymore. So they had to come up with ideas of how to cool the barrel. The first idea they had was water. Uh, Maxim actually ended up putting a jacket around the barrel that was filled with water, the idea being that this water is going to cool the air. Of course, the water would get hot, eventually it would still fail. So they also had the air cooling method, which allowed air to circulate. And the Germans actually had kind of an ingenious design in World War II, where they actually could really quickly pop a, uh, a lever, and this barrel would slide out, they could put in a new one. So they would take off the hot one and then put on a new one and let it fire until it gets too hot and pull it off and switch it back up to the other one. They just keep it going all day long. In fact, that was a machine gun that was nicknamed uh, either the Zipper if you were British or Hitler's Accordion if you were English. Uh, it actually could fire up to 1,200 bullets a minute, so even faster. Uh, in fact, there's kind of a funny little picture of uh, a German soldier in World War II pulling out the barrel of these things with oven mitts. And the oven mitts, like, you know, you think like German military, like, rah, you know, tough, and no, they're like flowers. That's like something your grandma would have hanging in the walls. I just think that's really funny for some reason. Any old who, that's pretty much that chapter in a nutshell, guys. Any questions? All right, fantastic. Uh, one quick thing uh, before we move on. Uh, I am looking at adding in your blogs. Are there one of your blogs? Yeah. Yeah. Or, okay, fantastic. Um, one thing I'm going to tell you guys straight up is that anytime you have a progress report, progress update, that grade is going to be wrong. It's incorrect. It can't possibly be correct because I do points out of total possible. So that means that if you look at the percentage, right now we only have like 150 points. So one homework assignment is weighing in at around uh, 7.8, 7.6% of your final grade. 
clearly that's wrong, by the end of it, we're going to have 400 points. So he's saying that it can't be right. So don't get that out of shape. If you want to know how you're actually doing, are you getting your blog, how are you going to have things in the test? We're not doing well, you know how to fix that, right? Correct or retake. So just remember you have those options and just do what you can. All right, guys.